introducing your course to the students by video or in person. During one of the CVM instructor development sessions, a question was raised about what we should present to the students on the first day of class. How do we prepare the students for how we want them to participate in the class and what their expectations should be for workload for the class and things of that nature. You might be presenting this in person if you are in a class that meets in person all the time, or you may be producing it as a video, and that would be if you have a very hybrid or very flipped or very online course, some paradigm where you're not going to be in person with the students as much, or just because this way you can create that video whenever you like, you can send it to the students, you can post it on the Canvas site, and they have it there to refer back to. So either one of those is a fine way to do it. If you do a video, it's recommended that you try to leave out specific things about the year that you're making the video in, so you can potentially use it again the following year if the course doesn't change significantly. This should not replace the syllabus, and this is actually a little screenshot from my intro video for preventive medicine, where I remind the students they're still responsible for reading the syllabus. The syllabus has a lot of information in it that it would just be foolish for me to try to present in this introduction, and that is their resource. That's what they should be referring back to when they have questions about the course. So I want them to read the syllabus, and so what I present for them does not replace the syllabus and makes it clear to them that they still need to go and read the syllabus. It also should just not be a recitation of what is on the syllabus. You want this to be engaging. It's the high points, the things that have been confusing in the past, things that you really want them to know about your course. And it's also your opportunity to introduce them to who you are as a person and as a teacher and what your hopes are for them about this course. If it's an in-person presentation, you should run it the way you hope to run the course. So if you intend to have a lot of active learning components in the course, for example, you're gonna regularly stop for review questions or think pair shares or things of that nature, do that as part of this presentation. Model how you're gonna expect the rest of the course to go. If it's a video, the concern always is that you send out the video and the students never even watch it. And then they come back to you with questions that you know they would know the answer to if they had watched the video. So some people will try to build in a mechanism to make sure that they watch the video. There's a little three or four question quiz on the video, or there are quiz questions built in that they have to answer as they watch the video to get all the way through it, or something else that makes them provide you with some evidence that they did watch the video. The sorts of things you want to present include philosophical things or sort of social things about how the course will be run, and then the information that you want to highlight from the syllabus as well. So here are examples of some things you might want to present. First of all, you might want to introduce yourself so they know who you are, and this is especially important um, for those of us who are going to see the students multiple times across the curriculum. They're seeing us now and teaching in a foundational science course, and then they're going to see us for preclinical courses, and then they're going to see us on clinics. The more they know who we are from early on, the more likely they are to come to us with questions, mentoring questions, clarification questions, ideas for them. How do I know if I want to be an intern or do a residency? So it's good for us to really let them know who we are so that they're more comfortable coming to us with questions or concerns. So examples might just be, here's, if it's a video, I show them a picture of me, here's who I am. So if you see me in the hall, you recognize my face. I went to school here. I am a boarded theriogenologist and now I teach. Just something real simple and straightforward so they have a basic idea of who you are and what you do and what kind of questions it might be logical for them to bring to you. What is your course and how does your course fit into the curriculum? And so I usually start, again, this is from preventive medicine, showing you an example of a slide up on the top. This is preventive medicine. This is foundational material for you throughout the course. You can see that I describe here, it's not intended to be all of the detail they need to know about all of that content. This is giving them a framework that then they will build on in their medicine courses and their surgery courses. So giving them an idea of what level of understanding they should have of this content and letting them know that they will see it again, getting more detail in those later courses. And that's important for foundational material because oftentimes students find it difficult to see why that's relevant. So tell them why it's relevant. And for core material, make sure they understand why everybody gets it. Why is it core? 
Is it because it really is transferable information? Like we like to say in comparative theory, oh, a uterus is a uterus. So if you learn how a uterus responds to things in the bitch, that's pretty much how it's going to do it in the mare. And so helping them to sort of understand how all of the information they're getting in the curriculum is going to help them achieve their career goals. That just makes them more engaged and interested in your course. What are the logistics of your course design? So first thing, is it an online course? Is it a hybrid course? Is it an in-person course? When do they need to be physically at the school? And this is important for them because they have so many obligations. They have their internal obligations, which we're very focused on. What do they need to do to be a student? But they also have a wide variety of external obligations. Many of the students have a job and need to have that job to make enough money to live. Many of the students have personal responsibilities. They have children, they have parents, they have significant others that they need to interact with and care for. They themselves may have personal concerns like illness or disabilities that we have to help them work through. So for them to understand right away what are the expectations for them to help them schedule around those other activities is very valuable to them. So on that same page, we want to let them know about the course offerings. Is it primarily going to be lecture? Is it a flipped classroom so you have to build in some time to watch things before you come to class? Is it primarily laboratory sessions? And if so, are there preparatory videos or other things before the lab? And again, that's to help them plan, help them build a calendar. We stress to them a lot, you need a calendar and you need to keep your calendar updated. And the more we can do to help them know what needs to be on the calendar, the better they will do that. We need to talk to them about personal safety issues. So if you have a laboratory in your course, you need to talk to them about what PPE they need to bring, what PPE we will provide. You need to talk to them about their personal lives. Some people are going to have disease conditions of their own that make it a greater risk for them to be exposed to infectious agents, for example. Some of them may be pregnant or may wish to become pregnant. Some of them may not be able to inhale anesthetic gases because of a respiratory concern or again because of pregnancy. And so there's all these sorts of things that they need to be thinking about and they can work with academic and student affairs if there's a significant concern. But you do want to sort of bring these things to their mind. They're not necessarily going to be thinking about those personal safety kind of issues and it's our job to make sure they are thinking about them. Disability accommodations is something that is stressed to them as their responsibility. If they have a diagnosed disability, they should work with our Disability Resource Center and specifically with Barb Blacklock, who is our liaison from that center, to determine what that disability means to their ability to meet the learning objectives for every course and to provide for all of us a logical way to work with them with their specific disability and what accommodations need to be met. So very important to remind them that this is not anything that can be used retroactively. This is a proactive process. They have to go to the Disability Resource Center. They work with Barb. Barb works with us to create appropriate accommodations for that student. And then the student presents it to the course coordinator. And that's what triggers our response to it. If they come to you after something and say, I have this disability and we should have done this, that's too late. And Barb is very, very specific about that. Disabilities are something the students are going to have, we all have, over our lives, and we've all learned to manage things that we need to do to help us accomplish our goals. And she wants them to learn that through the disability accommodations process. So remind the students that this office is there. They're very welcoming, very happy to work with our students and our faculty. And then tell them about the schedule. Really be clear about anything that's unusual about the course. I know it bothers many of the course coordinators that our courses are not scheduled on a consistent day, like preventive medicine doesn't always have time blocked off for the students Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 10 to noon or something. And that's just because it's very difficult to do, especially once you get later into the curriculum where we have all day labs, like the live animal labs are very long labs and so you have to schedule differently around those sort of big experiences for the students. So you just really need to be clear that they need to look at the schedule, they need to be very aware of the fact that it will not be consistent across the entire semester on what day and time most of their courses meet. And then talk to them about what are we going to do if there's bad weather or if they're positive for COVID or things of that nature. So they understand well ahead of time, here's what's going to happen if something comes up that changes the schedule. 
The grading scheme is a very important thing to present on that first day of class and to make sure it's very clear in your syllabus. So students by our accreditor are required to have a fair and transparent grading scheme and that's very much what they want. They want to be able to calculate their grade so as they go through the semester they have some idea where they stand in your course. And they're going to use that information to help them as adults make choices about where they're going to put their time and effort into their studying and their coursework. It shouldn't be some ridiculous thing that's very difficult for even an advanced mathematician to figure out. It should be transparent. And if for some reason the students do find your grading scheme a little bit more challenging, you should offer that you can help them think it through or create a simpler way for them to be able to figure out where they stand in the course. And I know that seems like an extra burden of work, but to me that should drive me towards having a simpler scheme. There's really no reason to have an enormously complex scheme. And if we need some help in thinking about how we present that, you can always contact the CVM Education Support Group at cvmces at umn.edu, and we can work on that together. Included in your grading scheme should be what the student's opportunities are to contest a grade. So after an assignment has been graded or an examination has been returned with the grades, you can set a time limit and say, I want to know within five days if you think you have something that was graded incorrectly. I want to know within two days. You can set whatever time limit you like. You can also tell the students how you want to receive it. So some people want a written um, description of what they believe the student perceives or what the student perceives to be the problem with their grade. And that comes to them as a written piece that they can then review so when they reply back to the student, either in person or as a return email, it's a very specific question with a very specific answer. Other people don't make that requirement. It's entirely up to you how much of this you build in. But it's a good idea to build this in and to make them aware of it very early. And that helps keep students from waiting until the very end of the semester and then frantically trying to find uh, a way to get more points, a way to change their grade. Give them your contact information. So basically, what are you going to do for them during this course? When will you be available? Will you have office hours or not? And if so, when are those hours and where is your office? And you can see my slide from Preventive Medicine telling them when my office hours are and where my office is and what it looks like. You can tell them what your boundaries are around your availability. So it says on my email reply that I do not answer emails on Sundays and I don't answer emails after 9 o'clock at night. And so they see that every time they, they send me an email, but of course you don't read those things. Once you've read it once, you never read it again. So it's a good thing to put into your introduction so they know right from the get-go, I am, cannot send something at 11 o'clock and believe that Dr. Wood is going to answer it because she stops reading emails at 9 o'clock at night. So let them know what your boundaries are. And then, especially if you're the course coordinator, make sure the students know who they're supposed to contact. Does everything come through you? Or if you have a course with multiple instructors, is it okay for them to contact those instructors separately and maybe just CC you so that you know that that happened? So be very clear with them about who they're supposed to contact as well. You should give these students some idea of what your expectations are for them. What are they going to do to make sure this is a, a good, high quality learning experience for them? So talk to them right away in the intro about your expectations for punctuality with their attendance, how you're going to track their attendance, what it means to have a due date for assignments and if you will accept late assignments or not, how they should find feedback or help as needed, and making sure that they understand it's their responsibility to identify when they need that help, and talking to them about how they're going to communicate with you and with their classmates. What should group work look like? And what are your expectations regarding how they will communicate with you as professionals? You may have other ideas of things that you want to include, and that's fine. I mean, you want this to be personalized. It's an opportunity to get people enthused about your class. It's an opportunity for people to get to know you better. So however you want to structure this is fine. These were just some basic ideas of things that I know have come up in the past and are sort of broadly recommended as best practices for this sort of introductory presentation or video. And if you need help making videos, here's the link from the educational support page about how to make different kinds of videos. If you have any questions about this content, I'm Peggy Root, and you can reach me at rootk001 
at umn.edu, or you can always contact the CVM Education Support Group at cvmces at umn.edu.